We're back, and uh, last time we were talking about um, various things with crystals. Let's just sort of recap verbally the things that we know, because it says, how do we know all this? What does that mean? <clears throat> we know, uh, because we've told you, uh, that the crystals can be simple cubic, face-centered cubic, body-centered cubic, uh, we've told you that uh, various densities that you calculate for a number of atoms in a line, number of atoms in a plane, and so forth, relate to things like strength. We were talking about various common crystal prototypes, you know, calcium fluoride being one, diamond, the zinc blend, the pro zinc blend prototype. <clears throat> so we've learned a lot. But how do we ever figure this stuff out? Because when you look at a crystal, particularly you know, any crystal that we're thinking about, but the ones for atoms, and we're really looking way, way down deep into the small size regime. How do we know what's going on there? <clears throat> Lately, you can see some of those things in an electron microscope, a high-res electron microscope, let you actually see individual atoms. Uh, but all of this was known before that, how much of it was known before that, and uh, much of it uh, was known before um, X-ray diffraction too, which is what we're leading up to in this section. And um, the question that's posed here uh, is a good one. How do we know all this? I, I think this is a very important question for scientists and engineers to answer because you will have non-scientists and non-engineering friends, I hope you will, and <clears throat> they often say, well, you know, science could say that, and uh, maybe it's wrong, or maybe um, it's just a bunch of people out there to uh, feather their own nest and, you know, uh, prove each other's proposals so that they can keep working on their, you know, ivory tower research jobs. I mean, these people still really exist. So uh, it's important to know certain things, how we know. And that way you can argue based on facts. And you will encounter people who just make up their facts as they go along and have their own alternative way of thinking of things. And it all boils down to simple common sense to, to them. Uh, you have to know how to defend yourself in those situations. And I think the main thing to remember is to stay calm and remember that science doesn't expect you to uh, just accept facts. Uh, let them bring it on. Your attitude should bring it on. Bring me your alternative facts, and let's carefully look at that and see if that uh, agrees with the world as, as, as we know it. And uh, some people know a kind of different world, and there's just nothing you can do to convince them. Uh, but just to uh, claim they're idiots is, is not helpful. So I was actually at an NSF workshop on that sort of thing many years ago at the National Science Foundation. And that was their recommendation. Just, you're the facts people. You know, scientists and engineers, we're the facts people. So that's why I want to talk a little bit about the main technique here that lets us know about crystals to the degree that we do, which is uh, diffraction of light or x-rays, which is just like light only at a higher frequency, shorter wavelength. <clears throat> it works out that you can get some of the same information from the scattering of neutrons. So neutrons can be produced and they can be given a de Broglie wavelength, de Broglie laws, mb lambda is equal to h bar. Uh, you can get them a de Broglie wavelength that is in the range uh, of the structures you need to probe. So the way this has to work, the way this has to work in general is that the light that you're using to study the object if you're going to have really high resolution, has to be about the wavelength of the objects you're studying. So for atoms, it's x-rays. For colloidal crystals, it can be visible light. Okay. For neutrons, we can get them down into that same range of wavelengths that you have with x-rays. All right, so uh, I highly recommend these uh, Michael McBride videos. I um, saw these and I just said, this is just unbelievable. This is really well worked out. <clears throat> it so happens that my best friend growing up was named Michael McBride, but totally different guy. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I don't think that has colored my opinions. So here's where we are. We've done a lot. And this will be uh, our fourth uh, video. The first two were sort of live, that, um, at least in the, the year 2020. Uh, we did those live, which I didn't think was great. And so we did chapter three, covered a lot, or the third video, and now this is the fourth one. And again, I will index these. You'll hear me stop and see me write down the index times. So we're going to talk about a thing called Bragg's Law, X-ray diffraction, a little bit about single and poly electro, uh, polycrystalline types of crystals. Uh, I think I'll not have a video on liquid crystals. Maybe we'll come back to do them uh, in, in, in a later section of the course. Uh, but it's in there in your student notes. And I have uh, added significantly to this slide deck. So I will tell you about that um, at an appropriate time. And I think I'll send you kind of like a, an update um, for the new slides that add. I better write that down. New slides. OK, update. All right, um, how do we know? Um, this is kind of what I was saying. Uh, we are required to have uh, sort of uh, wavelengths uh, for atomic scale structures of half to 50 angstroms. Uh, the periodic arrangement of these things uh, leads to the constructive and destructive appearance of x-rays. And the wavelength uh, character of electrons is why the Miller indices are all integers, okay? So this comes back to that basic properties that we know about waves, the sort of standing waves and then how they cancel out. Um, and uh, if they add positively, they can constructively uh, interfere for intensity, higher intensity, or destructively interfere. Okay, so this is kind of what we're saying. Uh, here, a very simple slide, one from the Sanders slide deck that comes with your book. And uh, it's interesting, what they've done here is they've added a sine wave uh, on top of a, a pulse there, and you can see that it sort of steps it up. Okay, So you can change the DC offset level. So this is an alternating current AC type sine wave, and uh, this is a sort of a step function. I guess you could make that into a square wave if you repeat it. Uh, but let's look at it as a, a, a wave with DC level. And uh, we step it up, and it just adds. Okay, So uh, constructive interference is if the uh, waves add together. Okay, I think you know that. Uh, destructive interference is when the waves are out of phase. In this case, 180 degrees out of phase. And you get nothing when that happens. <coughs> Now, I want to do something different. This is not in your textbook, and um, I can send you articles about this if you want, as much as you want. Uh, we can get you references for this, but I recommend to just sort of chill and watch. We're going to begin with scattering, because diffraction is a special, is a special case of scattering. Okay? Uh, you wouldn't know it to hear some of these materials guys talk even the protein crystallographers, to them it seems like, oh, scattering is, the, is over here and diffraction is over here. And uh, in fact, uh, diffraction is a special case of scattering. So we're going to begin with scattering and we're going to begin, um, we talked about that earlier when we, we talked about uh, polymer sizing and so forth. And, uh, but we didn't really show very much. And we're going to show a little bit more now. We're th that's what we do in this course. We cover something, then we come back and bash it again, and then we bash it again. So it's kind of a spiral staircase is what some people call that. So that's what we're doing here. And uh, so in this case, this is samples. Uh, the sample goes in, into a holder. Okay. Um, this is for visible light scattering. And so it's very important in visible light scattering to damp down any stray light reflections, scratches, and stuff like that. So this whole little cylinder here. It's like a beaker-sized cylinder, like the size of a, of a, of a, of a cup or something. Um, it's filled with stuff that, you know, hides scratches on the glass. If you have a glass that holds your sample and there's a scratch, 
um, the fluid in here, there's a fluid in there that has the same refractive index as glass, so the beam just goes through and doesn't generate a lot of stray light. So anyway, basic idea is you aim a laser at a sample. You have to stop the laser. Uh, that's a little horn-like thing here. It's called the beam stop. And it's like a little piece of shape, kind of like half of a banana. And then carve out the banana, paint it black inside, and then you'd have a beam stop. Um, you could put your eye back there, but you would go blind with the laser, so all these experiments have to be done under safe conditions. So the laser goes through, it hits the sample, boom, and light comes out. It's indicated with a dotted line because it's less intense. It's much less intense. The scattered light you can look at with your eye. It's fine. Okay, it's not dangerous. Uh, ignore this little vertical and horizontal stuff for now. That's don't, you don't need that. Okay, so that's the basic experiment. And here's uh, Kyle, who I think now is in med school or maybe in a residency even, using one of our machines. And uh, a detector is here. Back behind here, you can't really see it. It's a laser. Laser is coming and hitting this uh, polarizing element here. Kyle is putting a sample in there. And um, this system is safe to use with lasers, even without laser goggles. We're doing normal use anyway, so don't worry about that. Kyle is fine. <clears throat> and he's putting that sample in, and then he's going to rotate that detector to different scattering angles. See? We have a scattering angle theta. And uh, other machines are built to have multiple detectors. Instead of one detector that you rotate to different angles, you have multiple detectors. So this is just, you know, all simple background. Now, when the light hits, if the light hits, um, if the light hits a, a, an atom, let's just say it hits the simplest possible atom, hydrogen, okay? So here's light coming in. It's vertically polarized. Well, imagine that. So that means its electrical field is vertically polarized. So we'll draw a little up and down arrow, arrow there. And at the center here, in the center is a hydrogen atom. The electron, there's only one electron in there, that electron is going to go wiggling up and down, like that, okay? And it's going to be doing that at a frantic frequency. 10 to the 14th cycles per second is typical for visible light. For x-rays, uh, maybe a thousand times greater, depends a little bit, okay? And if you take an electron and you accelerate it up and down, that's how you make light. So, you know, we did some of that to make this light coming in here. This heavy green line is the main beam going in here. Um, but now we re-radiate some of that light we, because the... Um, electron is dancing up and down at a frantic frequency, it re-radiates, but it's only just one electron. I mean, you know, and even if it was a, a large molecule like sugar or something like that, it would only be, you know, a dozen and 20 electrons. It's not, you know, it's not going to be intense light. Um, it turns out that the radiation pattern that you get, the radiation pattern that you get has the shape of a donut. Uh, if there's an atom there right at the center, if we had an atom right at the center, uh, you cannot see the scattering from it if you look directly down from the top. You won't see it, okay? It's not there. So, um, but if you look in the plane of the scattering, you know, so we, we're going to put a detector. Let's see if I can get a pen going here. I guess we had the detector coming off at this angle earlier, something like that. So this is 30 degrees. And uh, we're going to imagine that this is a right angle here between the vertical direction okay, and that plane. So um, and we're going to rotate that to, to different scattering angles. And we're going to see it. But what we're going to find, uh, that if the molecule is small, uh, that the intensity is the same at all angles. Okay, So for small, small ones. And I make a plot of the scattered intensity as a function of theta. So this is generally theta. So we'll just say, you know, as I drew it, it's about 30 degrees. But now we'll just call it theta. And we would do this at a couple, you know, maybe 10 or 20 points here. We just rotate that detector. And we would see, you know, a flat line, flat line response. Okay. 
But if we look uh, down on the sample, I guess you shouldn't look down on anything, but you can look down on hydrogen to see if I care. Look down on the dipole, you would see no scattering. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, kind of the nature of scattering. And uh, it's only the electrons that are really moving because the uh, nuclei are so much heavier. They don't really, the protons are uh, so much heavier that they don't really respond to that electrical field oscillating by them rapidly. Okay, so um, now I want to move to a bigger particle. Okay, and in general, if we move to bigger particles here, and I make a plot, and I plot the angle, scattering angle theta, uh, it will go down in some way. Uh, that lets us assess size from the, you know, from the slope of these lines and actually the nature of the curve. They're not exactly straight lines. Uh, but this kind of going down information is what gives us size, sometimes shape, and so on. And so where this comes from is uh, how the light uh, interacts with the subvolumes in the particle. So the little green sphere here is imagined to be a particle, and you can see it's kind of on the same scale as the wavelength of the light. So the wavelength of the light here, um, let's see, the wavelength of the light might be like lambda. Lambda is the wavelength of the light. Uh, wavelength doesn't change uh, during scattering unless the molecule is moving. Then there's a slight change, and that turns out to be a very useful thing, but molecules usually are not moving very fast. So only, you know, the wavelength of light barely changes during the scattering. Um, when the light is scattered, uh, the phase inverts. So if we notice that we, we kind of come in, you know, like this, and then suddenly I start drawing it the other way around. I also made the amplitude, here's my initial amplitude, something like that. And then I made the amplitude much smaller. And in fact, it's really small. This is still you know, not drawn to scale properly. Because the scattering is such a weak process, only some of the photons get scattered. So uh, look at this lower ray. Now, the lower ray comes along, and it hits the subvolume A. And, but it doesn't hit it at a, at, at a, a node like uh, the, the, the first ray did. Okay, So I guess I can go back and get rid of some of this now. So you can see that the, the way I drew it, I had the first ray, the upper ray, hit the particle B, you know, kind of right at a node. Uh, a, when it gets that far along for hitting the, the subvolume A, the lower ray is not really at a node. Um, so it's, but the, but the phase still flips. So we're, you know, we're below the A point uh, for the light coming in, and then we flip the phase, and now we're above the A point. But the, the total distance here that the rays travel, let's get rid of this wavelength. This total distance that the from you know this point here, oops, pen, from this point here, and remember that's really you know off in the distance, that's a laser someplace, uh, to the detector here um, is you know it's thousands and millions of, of of wavelengths, not two or three like I've got here, uh, but you get the idea that the total length from start to finish is the same. So those are going to arrive in phase. They're going to arrive in phase, and when they do, um, the electric fields add up, and then you essentially square them. You take the complex con conjugate, and you square them up to get the intensity. Okay? So the phase is preserved in the lower direction, in the forward direction. And I should say down here to read the fine print here, uh, the most of the, this blue ray that's coming in uh, that blue ray uh, actually continues to go ahead. And if I really put the detector there, I'd probably blow it up, It'd ruin it with laser light. The detectors are pretty sensitive. They don't like very bright light. 
but I just didn't draw the incoming wave. I only drew the scattered wave. So sunlight is scattered towards the forward direction. And the main thing is it's in phase. It's in phase. So it adds constructively. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to go into design mode in this PowerPoint. And sure, keep the annotations. Come down here. And we're going to try to do um, an argument that uh, I hope helps. We'll see if it helps. I hope so. I'm going to grab that wave there. And I'm going to put it on the next slide. First of all, I'm going to move that out of my way because I don't want it there right yet. So there's that one. Okay. And it goes right where I want it to. It's awesome. Um, but what I want to do is um, also, let's see, Oops. let's get the other ray underneath. Okay, this is the other forward scattered ray. And we'll, we'll put that in too. And now I can rotate these. Now, if you watch J. Michael McBride's videos, you'll see that he has a much cleverer way for doing this. Um, that I really should probably just break down and buy at some point. <laughs> All right, so then we're going to rotate this, and we're going to look and see what this that happens at uh, some different angle. So the detector rotates with the... I pinned the detector to that upper ray. And let's go look at the little one again. Let's get them, you know, really oriented very closely to the same angles. Now, when you rotate like this, you don't really change the length. So PowerPoint is nice about that. So now we're going to go put that guy there. Remember, he goes a little bit above because of the phase inversion, but it's small. And what you see is that uh, this uh, upper ray here, this upper ray, It, had the, it has the same length, and the detector is still pinned to that. Um, but the lower ray here goes a shorter distance. It, it has a shorter distance to go. And so that means that it arrives out of phase. It's no longer in phase with the upper one by the time it hits the detector. Okay. So that's going to lead to partially constructive, or if you're a negativist, partially destructive interference. The intensity will have gone down. So this explains why the intensity goes down. Now, what if the particles were teeny tiny compared to the wavelength of light? Well, then that wouldn't happen. So if we had light that was much larger than particles, or particles that are much smaller than light, then when I do this little trick, nothing happens. Okay, basically it's the same distance because they're so close to begin with. All right, let's do one more. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I don't want to do that. Um, sure. Discard. Let's bring this in first. I was going to bring this in here. Before I go do that. Okay. So now I've got the situation at some finite angle. Okay, it's kind of like that. I think I really would rather have that hit closer to there. So I don't think I quite rotated exactly as I wanted to, but it's you get the idea that it's going to be out of phase. Okay, now we're going to go back to this original slide again. And I'm going to again grab that detector, uh, the, the upper ray and copy it. And I'm going to paste it into another slide. First, I'm going to again move this out of my way. And then I'm going to go and get the lower ray. it there. Okay. 
Now, this time we're going to go to very high angles. Let me get this guy out of the way first. And take this up array. Really? Get rid of you down here. And I just rotate. I'm not stretching, I'm just rotating. And I'm going to take that. That was the one that goes to B. And I think the angle I want here is not quite that angle. I put these little dots. You see the little dots there? I just put those there to guide my, my plants. But it's an iterative process because I'm not as smart as that guy from Yale who built this little apparatus for doing it. He calls it the scattering machine, I got a wave machine. It's a really cool idea. If uh, I had full access to everything and we were in session, I'd probably be inclined to try to build one of those, but not now. All right, so then the second one, that one, we're going to try to you know, get it at the same angle. We'll try to align the angles. Let's see if we can align the angles. And you can do this. I'm going to send you this presentation. You can try this. And I think you'll learn from it. I learned from it. And I've been doing this a long time. OK. And then this one should come there. And now you see what happened. Uh, now the two rays are hitting the detector almost out of phase. So if we bring our geometry in here, well, I should have done a little better. Um, you see that uh, the forward going, you know, light most of the light goes straight through. Now I have a higher angle theta. Um, the two rays almost coincide. Uh, but you see that the light from them arrives at the detector uh, almost completely out of phase, which is cool. And that's going to kill that light. When it's out of phase like that, it's like the, the, light, the light is being scattered, but it is going out of phase, and it's going to stay out of phase. Okay, if I move the detector back, it'll stay out of phase. Okay, it'll always be out of phase because the wavelength hasn't changed. So um, you could ask, uh, is that really true? Okay, and the answer is yes, it is. Okay, these are actual data that we obtained in the, one of the machines in the Opal Lab, and you're reminded that you can do as much of this stuff as you want. Uh, we have um, people actively studying in Opal, and they're getting their hands on equipment even now in this COVID age, and it is safe to work there. Uh, and what I've shown you here uh, in the blue dots are some points that we gathered. This is experimental intensity versus angle data. And you can see that it goes down almost to zero. And then it kind of comes up here a little bit. Now there's a fitted curve here, and I didn't do a very careful job of fitting, but if you follow the fitted curve, you can see that it also goes to zero there and just pops up a smidgen there. It does come up a smidgen. One way to magnify an effect like that is to convert the y-axis to a logarithmic scale. Okay, so uh, because the log of the number near zero goes off to minus infinity, so if I wanted to make a number, if I wanted to see an effect of something going towards zero, I should put it on the log scale, right? Because when it gets to near zero, the log is going to go diving down. It plummets, and that uh, is, is what you see here. Uh, but our fit to the data are not really tremendously good at these higher scattering angles. Okay, So we're fitting the data to an equation. There's an actual equation that you use to fit the data for the spheres. So this may, I don't know what this indicates. It may indicate that the spheres are aggregated. It may indicate that they're not uniform. I don't exactly know what, what that indicates. But um, anyway, it wasn't a particularly careful measurement, but it, you know, it gives you the idea that it really happens. Now, this has all been with visible light scattering. It's always been with like single particle, a single particle, okay? Uh, we're going to keep the single particle, but we're going to move to x-ray scattering. Now, uh, I hope it stands to reason that if I were to do this kind of analysis with very short wavelengths, if I was to have a very short wavelength, that I would need tiny, tiny angles to produce the out-of-phase destructive interference effect, okay? 
And so when we go to smaller polymers, this is imaginary. If I imagine this for visible light, I imagine this for polymers. I can do that with visible light because they're so big. Okay. What if I had a small polymer? Hardly any effect happens. So then I could try to go from visible light to what's next in the shorter wavelength, UV light or something like that. But it won't work because UV light doesn't transmit through samples. So it's not until I go all the way down to the hard X-rays that I get this, you know, electromagnetic radiation that penetrates through the sample. This is going to be a useless experiment if the light can't get through the sample, right? So in order to get some penetration of the electromagnetic radiation into the sample and to do the scattering, I go all the way to X-rays, and they're about a thousand times shorter than visible light. So my angles are now going to be super small, okay? And so that's what leads to small angle x-ray scattering. And here's, I think this is small angle x-ray scattering. It could be small angle neutron scattering data from Matthias Baloff. And I can tell you a story about this guy. You do not want to follow him uh, at a scientific meeting and have to give a talk. So this is my misfortune one time I had a scientific meeting. This guy gets up there. It's like God speaks, and I have to go talk about, I don't know, toaster ovens or something like that. So it was really <laughs> pretty kind of a tough day for me, but he's very, very good. Uh, he screwed up here, though. Uh, he didn't label his axis. I might almost think he was trained at Georgia Tech because something about Georgia Tech gets you guys not to label your axis. And we got to fix that. That's not happening, okay? Never more. Always label your axis. He should have done it. And even if you go into the figure legend, you can't figure out what he did. But look what's going on. The, what's the main message here? The main message is because he's gone to a shorter wavelength, he not only sees that going to zero, but then it kind of comes up again. He gets the intensity to come up again. This is on a log scale. So it, you know, it goes down almost to zero. He, he loses, I don't know, his, uh, it, my intensity here is 10 to the ninth, 10 to the seventh. So there's a factor of 100. So we're, you know, we've lost all but 1%. Let's just look at this top curve here. He's lost all but 1% of his signal. And then a little bit pops up pops up a little bit, you get another reflection, pops up because you go to a higher angle and things get a little bit better again, right? So if you think about, you know, rotating those waves around like I just showed you, if you go to a still higher angle, they'll, they'll start coming back in phase a little bit. Not very well, but a little bit they will. Okay, and then he gets another dip. So he gets these sort of like bumpy, bumpy bumps. And you really could only see this on the log scale because that amplifies effect. And um, the, the nature of what he's doing here, he's looking at particles and he's trying to understand are the surfaces of them soft or are they hard? And maybe it's very interesting to have particles. You can change that because uh, then you can have different kinds of interactions. You could imagine a series of particles that just expands and contracts, for example, to uh, I don't know, give you a, a colloidal elevator, you know, some sort of thing that's like a colloidal muscle or something like that. So this is cool stuff. But I will now show you a little bit about uh, what that equipment looks like, okay? Um, I showed you Kyle standing next to a machine where the detector just rotated one angle to the next, okay? Now what I'm showing you is uh, a small angle x-ray scattering machine. We built this back when I was at LSU. Uh, they have since totally torn it down and built it beautiful now. I, I have a picture of that. I just haven't got it in the slides. The x-rays come from accelerating electrons. Uh, all light comes from accelerating electrons. Uh, these electrons are accelerated in a circular path by making them go almost the speed of light very close to the speed of light, and then you make the electron move, uh, change directions uh, with very powerful magnets. And as it goes around the corners, it kind of goes, er, 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 and that, that noise that it gives off there is, is, is radiation. It's called electromagnetic noise. And we capture that as a pretty intense x-ray source. Sample goes in here, okay, and the detector goes way down there. And so instead of rotating an angle around back and forth like that, I have like a piece of film or something at the back. Literally, you could use film back there. In the old days, they did. Put a piece of film back there, and x-rays get scattered. Teeny tiny angles, but that's all you need, okay, um, because the object that you're looking at is very much larger than the, uh, the radiation. 
All right. But if we go to atomic crystals, metals, copper, iron, and so forth, now the x-rays are going to be in the same size range as the um, interatomic distances. And so it will again be useful to look at pretty high scattering angles, just like before. Uh, the neutron experiment looks like this. This is a, a Oak Ridge. This is one of the two machines there. We have not used this one in our lab, but we use another one of theirs. And you see this gentleman standing there. And I do not know if he is tall or small, but anyway, that is a big machine. <laughs> Somewhere back there, there's a nuclear reactor. I think this is one built on a nuclear reactor that makes neutrons and it hits a sample and they are scattered and then they come off in this direction. And they hit a detector there. I don't know how you detect neutrons because they kind of penetrate right through stuff. It's what they do. But uh, we figured out how to, to, to um, detect neutrons a long time ago. Guys got Nobel Prizes for that. And uh, so you get the idea that people are willing to build very big, very expensive machines to look at these um, questions. These are questions in polymer and colloid science. But um, that's basically the same theory for atomic crystals. Okay, so um, I need a break. I'm going to write down where we are. We are at 36 minutes. That is a long segment. Okay, sorry about that. All right, um, so we'll take a little break. I'll write that as an index. Um, and you should stop for a little bit and get a drink or something. Okay, enough time for you. <laughs> You could hit pause. Um, so, uh, main message so far is that destructive interference, even arising from within one molecule, diminishes the intensity. And now what we're going to do is go look at arrays of molecules or atoms, known as crystals, and we'll see a very special relationship here. There is no way to beat this Yale video, so you got to go watch that. I'm going to give you the, the short and quick of it, okay? And um, we'll sort of kind of derive the law. It's, 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 you'll see it's, it's really simple uh, at some level. Okay? So this is a picture uh, to show what's called Bragg's Law. It's called Bragg. There were two Braggs, the father and son. And they both got Nobel Prizes. I think the son earned his at the age of 26, so you better get on it <laughs> if you're <laughs> too late for me. Uh, they're handing out Nobel Prizes this week, so I'm not really waiting for them by the phone personally. But, um, and I, I don't think too many people at Georgia Tech are, or any place. It's a rare, rare thing. Um, let's see if we get this up here. Okay. I guess we will stick with this pointer. What I'm showing you is uh, an array of atoms. I guess I could draw it in there and then erase it. I guess that's what I could do. So I could say that this is a, a plane. And there are more of these black atoms in here. And they're in a crystal array. I'm having a hard time getting them uniform. Okay, but you get the idea that they're... They're supposed to be uniform, it's just that I can't draw that well. Okay, so we're looking at a plane, but we're looking at it just in the cross section. We're just looking at the cross section of this plane. And here's our, our light. I said because of our, um, our little scattering elements, our atoms or particles, are, um, are comparable to the wavelength of light, that's going to lead to fairly high scattering angles. So here is the light wavelength lambda. It's going to be sort of like one and a half angstroms if we're looking at atoms. Uh, it's going to be coming in here. It's going to go in that direction. That's called the incident beam, and it actually gets a vector associated with it called k. Um, never mind that. Uh, and then uh, it hits this atom. And some light gets scattered off. And actually, we saw that that gets scattered in a donut pattern. It goes in all directions. Okay, So it, it, it gets scattered off. Let's look at this particular direction. A scattered beam vector, we'll call that K sub S, a scattered beam. Okay, 
And then another ray comes along and it hits the atom on top of it. Okay, so that's basically the same thing. What you're looking for, uh, what happens in a crystal is these atoms want to scatter light in all directions. What they do, they scatter light. So a small atom will scatter light in all directions in the donut pattern. But much of that light will get wiped out by other atoms. We saw even for two regions, two subvolumes of the same particle that you would have this destructive interference. Now we're going to have that same kind of destructive interference arising from a, a different atom. Doesn't matter. The light can't tell anyway. And those atoms are in a regular array. And it's going to work out that only certain directions can emanate light. The molecules start to scatter light in all directions, but most of that light doesn't get out. Instead, the crystal selects certain directions to send the light and the directions are chosen. It's not like this is an animate object, okay? But anyway, the directions are, there are rules for deciding what directions, and the rule is, is that only when there is constructive interference can you get the light out. And so Bragg's Law comes from working that out, okay? Now, I have to say something about notation here. We've been troubled by notation since the get-go and somebody actually made a very early on somebody said, you know, can't we have one notation and stuff like that. And the answer is no. Okay, these communities, the scatterbrain community, that I'm kind of in that community, and the diffractionists, it's like, you know, it's like Republicans and Democrats. They never see things the same way. So um, for scattering people, the angle that we care about is this red one here, okay? It's the light was coming in at, you know, in this incident direction there. And now we've taken our detector and we've rotated over here through an angle theta. And we call that the scattering angle. The diffractionists, because of Bragg, uh, figured out that it looks to them like this is just a reflection off of these planes. And so they have their, uh, they use the same symbol, theta, but it means the external um, uh, the outside angle of reflection, okay? But the two are related. The two are related. One is twice the other. It's no big deal, but you just kind of have to know. All right, so I don't know if you can see very well here. It looks like I kind of have a... Let's see if it'll let me out. Yeah? Let me out. It lets me out, but will it put it... Where I want. Okay, let's zoom this. Interesting. I thought I had this problem fixed, but apparently not. Can you see that I'm hiding something there underneath this? Oh, what I'm hiding is the same thing, only it's, it's in the wrong font and it's not red. Okay, so. Um, the distance extra that you wind up traveling is d sine theta over 2. If d is the separation between these planes, this is the separation between the planes, the distance extra going out is d sine theta over 2, and coming in is d sine theta over 2. And you can see that. It's, 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 this is not a particularly difficult thing to, to, to see. You just have to follow your usual geometrical tricks. So when that distance coming in d sine theta over 2, going out d sine theta over 2, so 2 d sine theta over 2, when it's equal to lambda, when it's equal to the wavelength, we have constructive interference. Okay? If it was equal to twice the wavelength, we would also have constructive interference. Okay, so we get a couple of peaks, get them at different angles. So um, look at this detector as we've drawn it here. Let's go back. 
and I'll do some sort of a madam butterfly type thing. The detectors are like that. So the light is coming in on one hand, bouncing off those planes and going off on the other direction. And the way this machine, many of these machines work, is they open like that. So when they're, this is one angle, that's another angle, and that's another angle. Okay? So you actually get uh, different reflections as the system opens and closes like that. So the light comes in on one leg, goes out on the other leg. N lambda is M lambda, M is an integer, is 2D sine theta over 2 to scattering people or just 2D sine theta B. I called it theta B for brag. There should be there is a B down there. You can't see it very well. <laughs> but that's a theta B there. And uh, so I think that's it. That's that's Bragg's law. And it really only works well if there are lots of these planes in place. Okay, stacks upon stacks upon stacks. But, but that happens, goodness. We talked about how many planes there are. I mean the planes are separated by a few angstroms. You can have crystals of a millimeter. So I mean that's that's you know that's ten to the minus three. If I have a millimeter crystal and uh, that's 10 to the minus 3 meters, and I have the uh, interspacing between the planes. Let's just say that uh, one angstrom, to rough, rough about it, that's 10 to the minus 10. I have 10 million planes in a millimeter. So it's pretty likely that I can, you know, enforce this uh, constructive interference rule uh, really tight if I have all those planes. Okay. Hang on back then. All right. So uh, let's see if there's anything else that I meant to say here. Yeah, we covered this um, pretty well, I think. Uh, this is uh, another look at it here uh, from your book. Uh, their rendition of it. I don't think it's particularly good, although the notes that I wrote for that, you should read those. Uh, here's Wikipedia, of course. Uh, Wikipedia is getting things right all the time. Um, and that's kind of the nature of it. And it shows destructive interference and constructive interference. So as the, uh, like I say, the, the detector light comes in this way, goes out that way, converges at the sample, and they kind of open in this butterfly way. Okay? That's one way of doing it. There's many ways to do this experiment, but that's one way. And so you can change the angle and you'll go from constructive to destructive. And we even saw that. When did we first see that? We saw that starting to happen down here with our friend Baloff. Okay? So he had destructive interference, and then partially constructive again, and then destructive again, and partially constructive again. So this is, you know, it's, it's a known thing. Uh, here's a picture of one of these machines on the left, uh, aiming at some powder, and they're not exactly, look, it doesn't look totally symmetrical here, uh, but anyway, it's. They, they have slightly different designs. We have these over in the IEN. Uh, you can see that that's a U-tube. And the X-rays are coming out of this tube here. This, these are made by a tube device where they take electrons and bash them into a metal target. It generates X-rays. They get them going all in the same direction using some slits and pinholes or something. And uh, it comes down here, hits a sample on this plate, and uh, then they rotate around like that. That's one way to do it. Uh, the other way to do it, so this is sort of like a, a you know, uh, a source and a rotating detector, only the source and the detector can both rotate. The other way to do it is in that small angle type geometry that I saw you in. So this is actually a large spacings from silver behanate. Yes, it's a pretty good size molecule, a uh, crystal. And so it makes polycrystals, it makes crystals everywhere. They're little ground up into little different uh, orientations. And so uh, depending on the orientation of the uh, powder, this is a powder crystal picture, um, the light comes in and goes uh, that way, it comes in and goes that way, it comes in and goes down, it depends, okay? And eventually you get rings, and you see multiple rings. So the, the thing in the middle is the main beam going straight through, and then there's a first order peak, and then a second, and third, and fourth, okay? Well... Now, Bragg's law is a necessary condition. Uh, Bragg's law tells you when there will be constructive interference. But 
if I were to go back up here, let's go back and take a minute at this picture here. And let's suppose that I was to say, okay, that's great. You've got this crystal structure here. And let's see if I can get a pen. Um, marvelous. What if I have something else in here? What if I put in here like a, well, let's make it a BCC type crystal, okay? I hope I'm doing this right. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't really need that one at the center. That was silly. Get rid of that one. Okay. I got a bit of a bunch. Okay, let's go back and start over. Do it again. So now we're, you know, we're some sort of different crystal structure. Okay, so now I'm going to have light. I'm going to have to figure out what happens to the light that hits here. Okay. And you're going to see that the distance extra it traveled is um, half what it was for the other one. So that means I figured out for the black planes, for the black dots, I figured out a, a constructive pattern. And for the red ones, which, you know, exists, there's a, a plane of red underneath here, um, the distance is going to be like half. And it's going to work out as BCC if we, if we looked at this thing. Let's see something BCC. I have one, two, three, four, and then at the back, one, two, three, four. At the corners, I have eight, but there one eighth of them is in that unit cell. So there's as much intensity coming out of the center one, it is obviously one, as there is out of these other ones. So that BCC, that plane is not going to appear. It's going to be canceled. We, we, we tried to look at the plane, uh, you know, this is our distance A naught. Uh, we tried to look at that scattering, and um, it, you know it's just not there. It, light reflecting off those planes would be in phase, but it's out of phase with the plane in between. And there's just as many atoms in between as there are in the unit cell as there are at the, at the corners. So it cancels. So it's zero. Okay. So this is worth noting. Yeah. Discard them. Keep them. See if I can. All right. Let's see. So Bragg's law is a necessary condition for diffraction. But but it's not sufficient. You also need to have other things work out right. Okay? And so that leads to this uh, concept of diffraction of uh, selection rules for crystals. And here I would encourage you to watch the Sadaway video. And I think we put a problem in your current set. I'll have to go check if we put that in to let you try to do this, uh, to use this kind of information. But what you kind of need to know is the selection rules. Uh, these distances that we've been talking about, if it's a cubic crystal, we call them HKL, just like we've always been doing for our planes. So we had like the 100 plane, that's what, you know, if we go back to this, this would be like the one, really. <laughs> it's great. One zero zero plane, say. Um, is what we're looking at here. Okay, we're looking at one of those faces. 
So you've got different planes uh, that we saw a bunch of them, and we can get reflection off all of them if these conditions are met. For face center cubic, uh, they must be all odd or all even. For body center cubic, uh, the sum of HKL must be even. Okay, so look at what I just told you. The 100 zero, zero one, that's the one we just talked about. That's absent. Okay, 200 zero, zero is present. Sure, why not? If I was looking at the you know, now if my planes are half as big, I got it. I got scattering off of equal populated planes. And if I'm at that angle where the Bragg condition is met, then that will be fine. And that's going to be a shorter distance. Shorter distance means a higher scattering angle. Okay. That's just going on. <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. All right. Uh, this is a picture of one, another picture of one of these powder diffractograms. That's what you're seeing down here. And uh, the process, so you, what you do is you look and see um, for fundamental peaks. Okay, so if, uh, if you go back and you look at um, these... What you're going to get here, uh, you should see the two zero zero, and uh, the one one zero should be present, and so you can calculate from Bragg's law uh, what the angle will be if you know the wavelength of the instant light. Uh, for that, you can calculate what that'll be, and you see if it's present. But you're really working backwards. What you're normally doing is you're starting with some material like this. And you say, okay, I'm going to guess that that's the 200p. Zero, zero and if it is, then I expect to see the 110p, one, one, if it's BCC. Okay? So I go over here and I calculate what that angle would be. And I say, oh, it's there. Good. That's a sign. Let me check some more. And you check all the combinations and you so called index the peak. This is actually called indexing. Um, I'm always big on reminding you that all this crystal stuff really also holds for large molecules, not just atomic crystals like the metals or ceramic crystals like sodium chloride and so forth, ionic crystals. It holds for large things. Look at what happens when you do it. Okay? And, and if you look at the Yale video, he shows you a reasonably sized molecule. He looks at that. Uh, protein is a big, big molecule, and you get lots and lots of points off of them. Oh my goodness, you get so many points. Okay, so many points are found, and uh, there's a certain symmetry to them that reflects the underlying mass. And then you actually look at the intensities of the patterns uh, to figure out where the electrons are. And he kind of describes that in the Yale video. That's beyond us a little bit, but it's a very powerful technique. Okay. All right, again, I need a break. Um, we saw that. Um, we're going to look just briefly at uh, single and polycrystalline materials. Mm, although we saw that you can make very, very large crystals in that video for the National Ignition Facility. What a beautiful, huge crystal that is. By the way, we had a contest once I taught a lab where we had a contest who could make the biggest crystal of that same stuff, KDP. And somebody in the lab actually made one. Um, he made one not as big as that, but he made it about an inch big, about the size of your eyeball, say. Uh, and he won the contest of growing a pretty large crystal for that group. So it's, you know, it, it is possible to do it in the lab and not just hit the National Ignition Facility with millions of dollars. But mostly you have crystals that grow a certain distance and then they bump into some other crystal, okay? And that leads to things called grains. These are grains, and these are called grain boundaries, and these are called polycrystalline materials. And you see the orientation can be different, and that's why we get that sort of ring-like powder pattern, okay? And you can see this on campus. I guarantee you. You will see this on campus. Now that I have told you about it, you will see it the next time you walk by a lamp post. You're walking across that bridge, going to Tech Square, you got your mask on, you're going to go to the Waffle House. I don't know what you're going to do. But you walk there and you look at those lamp posts and you'll see this pattern. Okay. 
Okay, it's probably might be uh, zinc. I don't really know what the covering. I don't know if it's really going to be aluminum, but you will see that pattern. And now that you know about it, you'll see it all the time. Okay. I don't want to talk about this. Uh, there's an ASTM, Society of Testing Materials, standard protocol for measuring these sizes. And so I don't care about this sort of stuff. But you should know that this is important enough that people do it. Okay. And uh, the higher the number, the finer the sample. Uh, finer the grain size. So in that sense, it's like sandpaper. You know, if you ever built anything out of wood, you start with a coarse sandpaper, 60 grit, and then you move to 100 grit, 120, 200, and so forth. If you haven't worked with wood, now is the time. As soon as we open up again, you're at the place for it. We have a beautiful wood shop here. If you're an engineer, you should really be doing things with your hands and not just sitting there at a computer. Uh, both kinds matter, but Okay, we've done it. I'm not going to do um, liquid crystals now. I'm going to try to come back to that later. We'll spiral staircase that, I hope. Uh, same basic idea that you have some order and regularity in a sample, but this time for some reason it flows. It's really cool. Uh, I'm just going to tell you about this step through that a little bit about polymorphism, but we already saw it in a way, okay? Uh, polymorphism, we have diamond. You know you can have graphite. So polymorphism is you have the same elements doing different things. It's not, not a very big deal. So we've done it. We've kept it at an hour. Um, I'm sorry we're a little bit long. Uh, but in um, any case, I'll try to index it for you by uh, the couple of topics. We didn't do too many topics, but that's it for now. And I'll see you soon um, in the live session, I hope.